All right, this is part seven of our book study through Dane Ortland's Gentle and Lowly. Uh, coming closer to the end here, I uh, continue to hope that this has been a, a help for you all who are following along. I've talked to many of you. I'm just excited that we're able to, to do this together. For this week's video and next week's video, uh, Ortland sort of shifts. Uh, we've mainly been talking about Jesus in the New Testament. Here he short, sort of shifts to the Old Testament to talk about um, the, the image and the description that we get of God from Old Testament passages. So in chapter 15, which is called His Natural and Strange Work, uh, he, the, the theme verse is Lamentations 3.33. Uh, he does not afflict from his heart. And the main question that we ought to be asking in these two chapters is, how does the heart of Christ fit with the God we read about in the Old Testament. Again, Jesus himself is God, and what what these chapters sort of do is to help us to, to not draw a division between the God we read about in the Old Testament and the God we see physically in the New Testament. Uh, Ortland writes, when we see Christ unveil his deepest heart as gentle and lowly, he is continuing on a natural trajectory of what God had already been revealing about himself throughout the Old Testament. He goes on, he simply provides an unprecedented flesh and blood reality what God had already been trying to convince his people of down through the centuries. And he has that quote from John Calvin who talks about how the Old Testament is the shadow and the New Testament is the substance. That's a good way to think about it. The Old Testament described who we would actually see in flesh and blood in the incarnation of Christ. Uh, Orland brings up a reminder, he says, remember the beauty and utter divine sovereignty, uh, remember the beauty of utter divine sovereignty over all things good and bad. Uh, that's helpful for us to think about, and if you're in a discussion group, maybe you'll talk about that. What does it mean that God is over all things, that nothing comes to pass outside of his control? Uh, that can be a hard and challenging thing for us to think through, especially when we think about the hard things that have happened to us in our lives. Uh, to, to know that God uh, at least allowed those things to happen to us uh, for his purposes. Orlin shares the Belgic Confession, Article 13, which says, This doctrine gives us unspeakable comfort, since it teaches us that nothing can happen to us by chance, but only by the arrangement of our gracious Heavenly Father, who watches over us with fatherly care, sustaining all creatures under his lordship, so that not one of the hairs on our heads, for they are all numbered, nor even a little bird can fall to the ground without the will of our Father. So that's sort of putting these big ideas about God together. What it means that God is sovereign, that he's all-powerful, all-knowing, in control, nothing happens without him uh, causing or allowing it to happen, but also that the heart of God is the heart that we've been reading about in Jesus, God the Son, that God is gentle and lowly, loving, merciful, and compassionate, and God does not change. So it's that compassionate, merciful God who has allowed hard things to happen to you in your life. It gives us a lot to think about, doesn't it? Uh, again, from a couple chapters ago, A.W. Tozer said, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And then Ortland closes, left to our own natural intuitions about God, we will conclude that mercy is his strange work and judgment is his natural work. Rewiring our vision of God as we study the scripture, we see, helped by teachers from the past, that judgment is his strange work and mercy is his natural work. We'll hear more about that in the coming chapters. Chapter 16 is called The Lord, The Lord. It comes from Exodus 34, verse 6 and following, which says, A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Exodus 34 gives us that great image and description of who God is and what he is about, and it's repeated throughout the Old Testament. Our Orland brings up sort of an interesting and challenging thought on page 147. It talks about God's glory, and he says that often when we think about God's glory, we think about his grandeur and his might and his power. And he sort of says when the Bible talks about God's glory, first and foremost, it seems to talk about his goodness and the merciful and loving aspects of his character. 
He says the glory of God is about his goodness before it is about his might. Uh, that's, a, that's new for me. I'll say that. It's interesting. And so uh, I want to think al- about that more along with you this week. He shares a quote from John, or- uh, John Owen, who says, When God solemnly declared his nature by his name to the full, that's Exodus 34, that we might know him and fear him, he does it by an enumeration of those properties which may convince us of, of his compassionateness and forbearance. And not till the close of all makes any mention of his severity, as that which he will not exercise toward any but such as whom his compassion is despised. That is, it's not that God isn't wrathful or just or severe in his punishment. He absolutely is. But it's it's everything we've been talking about throughout this book. God is simple, which means that he's all of his attributes all of the time. And it seems like the testimony of the Bible that this book is trying to draw out is that God's character and heart is first and primarily goodness and love and gentleness and mercy towards sinners. Uh, that, that's, That's what stirs the heart of Christ and thus the heart of God. It's only judgment and wrath. Uh, and punishment that comes to those who reject the goodness and love and mercy of God. Ortland closes uh, this section by saying, The fall entrenched in our minds dark thoughts of God, thoughts that are only dug out over multiple exposures to the gospel over many years. Perhaps Satan's greatest victory in your life today is not the sin in which you regularly indulge, but the dark thoughts of God's heart that cause you to go there in the first place and keep you cool toward him in the wake of it. That's sort of, I think, the main thing that we ought to think about with these two chapters is when we picture God in our mind, do we picture that angry, wrathful, waiting to smite us God? Because if you're in Christ, that's just not your reality anymore. Uh, it's, the gospel is is a pronouncement that we have been set free and brought into the family of God, and there's now no more punishment awaiting us because Jesus took all of that punishment for us. That's that amazing proclamation of the gospel. Instead, we can know God as that merciful, loving, gentle, and lowly Savior, because that's who he is towards us. Uh, questions in the description of this video. I think this these next couple chapters are really going to give us a lot to think about, a lot to discuss, uh, because this emphasis on who God is, his character, uh, isn't one that I is, is on the front of my mind very often. And so I'm thankful for that opportunity to be thinking about this and not, not to be convinced or have our minds changed because Dane Ortland says so, but that it would point us back to scripture and allow us to to have our understanding of God shaped by the Bible. I think that's what this book is valuable for. So thankful for you, uh, praying for you as we go through this book together. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be back with the next two chapters, chapters 17 and 18. We'll see you then.